everyone, this is Mike Willie, your host here on the Tech CFO Podcast, where we interview amazing financial executives from tech companies about how they run their organizations. Now the goal here is of course to uncover the best tools, the best, tr- best tricks that financial executives are using at the best tech companies so that you can use them in your organization and in your career. Now this podcast is created by us here at CapShare. CapShare is software that allows you to manage your cap table and all of your equity needs in one place. So it can help you with issuing stock electronically, it'll help you to expense your stock options, stay compliant with 49A valuations or 83B elections, and we're proud to say that we have the most powerful tools for modeling out scenarios. So for example, you can see exactly how that round of financing will affect you at different exits and a lot more. CapShare has over 10,000 companies, investors, and lawyers all using our platform. You can check us out at CapShare.com. All right, I would like to welcome you to this episode of the Tech CFO Podcast. I'm excited to introduce you to Brad Reese, who was just brought on board as the Director of Finance over at Grow, which is a business intelligence platform. Now they have over 100 employees, they've been growing rapidly, they're really just killing it right now, and that's part of why they brought Brad Reese on there as their first financial executive leader. So prior to Grow, just to give you some background, Brad worked at InsideSales.com and at Intel. So in this interview, Brad gives us a really fantastic blueprint of what a new finance exec can and really should be able to accomplish in their first four months. So we'll discuss how Brad built, built and implemented formal processes, how he prioritized them, Of course, this includes how we tackle budget, forecast, and controls to take into account every single employee, their pay, commissions, unique benefits, all that stuff. But you'll also be able to learn how he was able to almost immediately bring in more cash by reducing their outstanding AR balance by about 84%, as well as new processes that eliminated almost all time that was previously being spent on commission reconciliation with sales reps, which if you've ever had to do that can be a fairly time consuming process. And we'll discuss also why and how they were able to expand their physical presence internationally with an office in the UK. And Brad will share with you the model that was used to make that decision how he tested it first to make sure that he had de-risked it as much as possible, and all the obstacles that they had to navigate to ultimately get to where they are today. And all of that, by the way, was accomplished in the first four months or so at Grow. So it was just amazing. Now the show notes and links will be found on capshare.com forward slash blog. You'll have the opportunity to post additional follow-up questions if you have any there. Love to hear uh, any questions you have about further details that you'd like to hear. And without further ado, please enjoy the story from Brad Reese of his first four months as the Director of Finance at Grow. I think you're going to learn a lot. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we really appreciate it. You know, we're, we're trying to kind of get out to to some of the some of the kind of star CFOs of some high profile and very fast growing companies, not only uh, just here locally, but also, you know, in the CapShare, broader CapShare network. So we're reaching out to a lot of our clients and talking to their CFOs and trying to ask them some questions that we think could be uh, broadly applicable to other CFOs in the CapShare network. And CapShare now has over 10,000 companies on the system. And um, a lot of those are kind of high growth, early stage startup companies. So they can benefit a lot from the experience that you have. So what before? So before jumping in, would you mind just kind of introducing yourself? Maybe giving us a little bit of more than just your name and background, but but a little bit about maybe even, you know, just kind of your last couple of jobs and how you landed here at Grow. And, and I know you're relatively new, so yeah, it'd be good to just kind of hear that story. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. I uh, I 
uh, have been working, I've come up through the corporate finance uh, route, uh, and I got my career start at uh, Intel, where I was for quite a few years. Um, and uh, I worked at Intel uh, managing some fairly large R&D budgets, and, uh, and then for a time I was actually in a, in a factory doing uh, uh, cost and inventory management, and so had some, you know, had a great foundation that I was able to to build there. But uh, I found that I was I was continually just passionate for the venture capital and, and startup world, and and uh, um, had a great opportunity to to leave the corporate finance uh, or you leave um, Intel and, and then move into uh, into more of a startup type role. And so I, I left Intel after a number of years and, and started working at Inside Sales. Um, as a senior finance analyst and, and had a great experience there for a couple of years um, uh, where um, I managed our, uh, our sales finance and then I also helped launch our uh, Europe business and then um, oh, cool. was a finance lead for, uh, for Europe there, which teed me up perfectly for my new role here at Grow. As, uh, um, I've been here for just a short amount of time, but in the time that I've been here, I've actually launched a Europe business here as well. So it's been, oh, wow. uh, so it's been great. and. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, a fun ride so far, but uh, a lot more to a lot more to come. Yeah. And what's your technical title here? Just just so we have it on the recording there. Uh, director of finance. Yeah. Director of finance. Great. Yep. Um, and probably um, and then I guess we have I guess just a set of kind of broad based questions for you. Oh yeah. And just actually yeah, before no, we do that yeah. Uh, just if you could give us a, just a brief introduction to Grow for oh, yeah, listeners who aren't familiar. We're actually a customer of Grow, so we're a fan. <laughs> yeah, but. that's great. Um, uh, we, uh, so Grow is a, it's a business intelligence uh, software uh, that we, uh, or we'll, we'll dashboard uh, business management type data. So we build out API connections um, into various different data sources, whether it's Salesforce or, or you know, your HR uh, data source or whatever it might be. We pull that data into a uh, into a into a central location where you're then able to visualize uh, that data. We like to call it your business command center, where you can see all of your business data in, in one place, that's in, in a one digestible spot. Yeah, and I thought I saw one of your monitors up with all of your KPIs and dashboards and stuff, and uh, it's really cool. Yeah, that's our favorite to thing to do, and we love our favorite thing is to walk into uh, into our customer's office and see our dashboards all over their office uh -huh. too. It's awesome. Yeah. We don't have ours up, but we are users of Grow. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have it up for a while. Do you remember what we had it up in our sales in the sales room? Yeah, for a while. So, but uh, currently, uh, but we we do use uh, the dashboards quite frequently. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's probably been a, a huge ride and adventure, kind of jumping into your position. I bet there's been a lot of things you've kind of had to do, and um, I imagine there's a lot of. Um, other you know kind of new you know finance uh, roles and folks who are find themselves in a startup who are probably going through similar situations as yourself I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about kind of what I guess one um, and these are probably two separate questions but one kind of what process you know improvement have you made that you're especially proud of and maybe just kind of walk us through what it was like when you first kind of joined up like what was your to-do list who were you talking to what did you first want to get your mind wrapped around and figured out and, and can i sorry and before you answer that i do want to say one thing <laughs> i'm sorry I, I, I gotta interrupt here so grow i mean i do i know we can't share any financial data but i think it's useful for the listeners to know it's kind of order of magnitude even so so i'll just say you know grow is i've seen grow go from basically you know a five-person startup to a very a relatively large and quite successful organization over a period of approximately three years, um, and and I would say you know we can share probably public information. So like what series? How, how many? If you you disclose some fundraising uh, amounts, right, or, or, or rounds. So can we can maybe give us a sense of where you're at from like a series perspective? Oh yes, we completed a Series A round about uh, just over twelve months ago. Okay, um, so twelve months out of a Series A, yep. and I think that gives you a rough sense for how you know a, for a rough sense of like kind of what stage you're at, right? Yeah. Um, I would say growing very very fast. Um, I think that's safe to say. Um, and you know, are you planning on raising another round anytime soon, or is that something that you're disclosing at this point? Um, uh, yes, I think as uh, as the financing needs come up, we will definitely uh, raise another round yeah. um, when needed. Yeah. Okay, great, cool. cool. So, so I apologize for that, but I just wanted to give a little bit more because you know, obviously, the, the startup challenges of a director of finance position 
change like dramatically from when you're a five person, you know, series seed organization to, you know, maybe like a, you know, over a hundred person organization or, and, and certainly when you're at a, something like a inside sales where you're what now 800 employees plus, or maybe even more. Um, they were, uh, around 500 employees. Okay. So 500. Yeah, I think it's about where they're at now. Yeah. But, I but mean, still, yeah. Huge differences, right. In terms of the di- different types of challenges. So anyway, sorry, I just want to give that context and then yeah. Yeah, feel free to answer Mike's question. So. Sure. Yeah, Great. Perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah. So to answer your question, um, you know, it's interesting because I, uh, before, um, I'm in, in one sense, kind of the first like dedicated finance professional at the company. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean, full time dedicated. I mean, we've, uh, you know, they've done a great job managing finances and, and using outsourced, uh, you know, uh, accounting help and so forth. Um, and, you know, and I have to say I was, I was impressed with the shape of things uh, when I arrived. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but then I arrived. And the other thing that I'll say just to tee things up is in my, in my experience, in my short tenure here so far, I would say that it, is, it has to be the dream of every finance leader to come be the finance leader of a data company like Grow. <laughs> because when I got here, the data was it's just clean, clean and crisp across the board like <laughs> it, for everything you know the the, the sales data the finance i mean just everything uh, was was in in pretty good order when when i arrived so that allowed me to very quickly turn around and um you know and, and provide budgets and and fairly fairly robust like you know uh, revenue and cash forecast models um expense models and, uh, and, and some other things to really help uh, give guidance to, uh, to the overall business. Now, that said, there were no formal finance processes in place. So, you know, when you ask, um, you know, what kind of process improvements have I made, I would maybe switch that verbiage a little bit to process establishment mm-hmm. uh, type work that I've, that I've done versus process improvement. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, actually building out processes that didn't even exist. And, and, that, and that, that's like, it's not that's not saying anything bad about grow right i mean every startup is going to go through that I mean, yeah you, you don't start with you know again the the types of processes that you would see at an inside sales and so so yeah that's great anyway so you've established a lot of processes right yeah a lot of and you know and, and not to say that there were loose ends when i arrived but i've tightened things up and, and right. you know established those those finance processes that um that need to be in place so i mean maybe just to walk through um you know some of the things that I've had to tackle since since I've arrived. Yeah. You know, first things first is uh, you know finances and and, and and what I would categorize as finances would be uh, uh, budget forecast and and and, uh, and controls to put in place. So when I arrived, I first built out a, a budget and I've gone through a couple of revisions of that budget now. But it's actually one that I feel very comfortable with. It's a it's a pretty meticulous expense budget that like takes every single employee into account and their their pay and their commissions and benefits mm-hmm. your their unique benefits per employee etc mm-hmm. how um, did you build that out um, it, it's it's a it's a model that's in Excel and okay. basically you know I just leverage our, our HR our data again you know great data here so I was able to mm-hmm. leverage our, uh, our HR data that I just do kind of a, a, a data dump so to speak into um, into this model and, and it updates automatically with with all the updated salaries and, and benefits and so forth so cool. um, you know so uh, put that together I also um, have put together a data source of all of our subscription contracts and and um, um, you know I've modeled out uh, some of those and, and basically just gone from from one end of expense to another so personnel commissions um, uh, you know um, subscriptions uh, facilities, uh, um, other legal costs and insurance costs, and then all other like travel and other other related spending at, at the department level, mm-hmm. and I've forecasted that out, which is which is great, and that includes a you know forward looking hiring plan, um, mm-hmm. and now that that now that that expense buzz, expense budget is in place in um, you know in conjunction with a new revenue forecast model that I've put into place we and uh, in cash collections we have an idea of mm-hmm. of what our cash burn number is going to be over the next uh, um, time horizon and so that's great and so that's enabled me to say this is you know this is the baseline and this is what we need to hold ourselves against mm-hmm. so that makes approval processes much more black and white for me as mm-hmm. uh, as a finance leader so when somebody wants to to give a raise or they want to you know uh, go hire somebody 
um, you know, not only do we have a budget to hold ourselves against, but there's also a very specific process that we're driving uh, within the company for around raises and around around new hires um, for subscription software subscriptions or what, whatever it might be. So, um, so that was the first thing to tackle. The next thing was um, was accounting. Um, we uh, we still work with uh, with an outsourced uh, um, third party uh, accounting group. They're very very good and super helpful. So they do a lot of our bookkeeping and then they close our books at the end of at the end of each month. Mm-hmm. Um, do you foresee using them just just uh, and maybe you were going to go there, but really quickly, do you foresee just keeping them in place all the way through? Uh, like a Series B, or uh, do you, do you, is that something that you generally would transition out of at, at some point, at some stage in a company's growth? And do you feel like you're getting close to that now, or, or no? Is it, you know, because I've I've kind of seen different companies have a different answer to that question. I'd just be interested in your perspective. That's a good question. Yeah. I do foresee us. Um, uh, you know, I I don't know how long. Um, I don't necessarily foresee entirely severing that relationship as much as. Um, definitely needing to bring on a more experienced uh, accounting controller. So by my background, I'm corporate finance specifically. And so there's a lot of like, you know, uh, regulatory and compliance type things that I don't have experience with um, that, uh, you know, it it would be helpful to have somebody with that expertise Mm in-house, especially to prepare us, you know, in the future if there were, you know, uh, rounds of funding with new investors or something like that. I I just, we... We want to have more uh, certified uh, financial statements moving forward, and, and mm-hmm. so that's definitely a, pro- a, a route that will will go down at some point. I don't know the timeline, um, but it's certainly in my mind. Yeah, yeah. And a quick follow question, and I, I don't want to stop you because I'm loving the list that you're going through. So, yeah. So like, I don't want to lose momentum on that, but I do yeah. want to camp on this just a little bit. Sure. Do you have audited financials at this point? No. no okay. We do not. When do you think? Uh, that would happen and what do you think is like a norm just in general when do you think companies kind of move over to where they're like yeah we need to start having audited financials do you feel like that's something that's generally driven by investors or how how do you look at that um it's definitely something that's going to be driven by investors for sure Mm -hmm. yeah um and so you're kind of like hey as long as we as long as investors aren't asking for it then we're not going to go down that path because it's a ton of work right (laughs) i mean is that is that a little bit the perspective or i i I agree with that however i i uh i do look at it a little um more proactively than that Mm -hmm. just from the perspective that i don't want to an audit (laughs) is a long process yeah and so so what I've actually been doing lately is actually kind of uh, probing the, the my financial uh, leadership market here in the valley, just asking around, um, you know, what uh, what the right time, you know, what requirements are in different series of fundraising, um, what those requirements might be, um, you know, and I, I think it comes in a in in a in a series um, or of steps. I mean, you know, we're on um, our financial system of record right now. Is QuickBooks Online? Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, I, I think the first thing is, you know, in um, in this order, but with no um, specified time frame yet. But I would say, you know, we're on QuickBooks Online. Uh, at some point, we'll bring on, you know, a more sophisticated accounting controller who can, can, um, you know, in conjunction, you know, I'll, I'll provide the finance leadership. They provide the accounting leadership. We migrate from QuickBooks to a more uh, robust, sophisticated ERP. Um, whatever the system yep. might be. And that person would probably help you make that decision at that time, right? Right, yeah. agreed. The, the new accounting person you bring on, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then once that transition is made, then I would say sometime okay. around that same time frame would then start asking ourselves, you know, now that we have cleaner, more accessible, analyzable data, um, you know, then we would say, when is our, when's our next round of funding? What, uh, what are some of the additional um, you know requirements around uh, around uh, certified financial statements, and and then we'll make a determination from there um, mm-hmm. what the right next step is. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. So thank you for camping on kind of some audit questions there. So we're, you were kind of walking you through kind of the process steps that you've been implementing. You know. So anyway, so do you mind returning back to that? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, sure. So uh, I think we kind of so uh, we covered the. F- finance piece of things so then and, and we started jumping into accounting, accounting. so mm-hmm. we have our you know we do have our uh, third party uh, group that we're working with they're doing a phenomenal job the one area that uh, you know this and, and so they were and they, they've been helping out with keeping our books um, up to date and then um, you know they've also been handling a lot of work for us with uh, AP and uh, and a little bit of AR but when I when I arrived um, 
I would say the AR was probably the the item that was um, that needed the most nurturing at the point at mm. that point. So we actually brought in a, a dedicated uh, person to um, start reaching out to customers and, and helping us with some of our collections. Okay. Um, and uh, and that's gone really well. In the past three months, we've brought down our outstanding balance by over eighty four percent. Wow. So it, it, we made a big dent. It wasn't a, it wasn't that it was a massive problem, but uh-huh. it was just some organizational cleanup type work yeah that we some of that drive. low-hanging fruit that you just had to kind of go out there and it, it was it was low-hanging fruit but we uh we have a phenomenal um, employee that just he's so structured super organized mm-hmm. and uh just gets um, it done and he gets it done so it's it's a it's a big win for for the accounting department uh for sure and a big win for for the overall organization as well but yeah, I mean, that's bringing a lot of revenue that was potentially not coming in, right? So yeah, having that cash in the bank has been it's has been, been awesome. It's been great. Yeah. What about AP? You said AP is being handled currently by the outsourced vendor. Still, is that kind of how that's? Yeah, so we um, in conjunction with us. So uh, you know, we have a, a small accounting team here, um, uh, and um, one individual is handling the collections. Um, the other individual is. Uh, um, is uh, receiving invoices um, uh, and handling AP overall. So, and you know that we, that individual is organizing invoices and then um, uh, working with our CPA firm, who's actually um, uh, pushing out the the payments. So they're the ones conducting that, um, and then um, and then we work in conjunction with them to attach invoices to records and, and QuickBooks and so forth, and make sure we have a record of everything. Makes sense. Um, yeah, the other the other piece that uh, that I uh, wanted to tackle when I arrived was um, uh, payroll and uh, and commissions, mm-hmm. um, and we've been working uh, through that. Uh, the one uh, you know one area in the commission space specifically um, is uh, we w- I I really wanted to drive some more uh, transparency for our sales reps here, mm-hmm. and so we've got a we have one individual on on our accounting team, the same person who's handling AP. He's just very, very talented in Excel, and so I worked with him, um, and he actually built a, a great macro for us uh, in Excel out of our commissions model that we use to run commissions each month for, for all commissioned employees here, not just sales reps. Um, and uh, and this macro actually generates and uh, it automatically generates a, a, a detailed sales voucher PDF um, mm-hmm. for every commissioned employee, so it shows. You know, by deal, like exactly what mm-hmm. they sold and how much commission they're getting paid. For example, if it's a sales rep, um, and uh, and so forth. So, so that was a great, uh, that's a huge a, win, a great win yeah. for. Uh, and that for that goes well. kind of. I mean, that's definitely falls squarely into that area where finance is kind of adding sales and marketing value as well, which is you know kind of kind of fairly you know that that that's that's a neat thing to be able to kind of tout to the whole organization as well right hey you know yeah i know you know me as the person who closes the books at the end of the quarter and and you know who who says no on raises <laughs> you know like yeah. like i mean a lot of the unsexy stuff and you now corporate your corporate finance background is, is pretty sexy stuff it's that's your you know you're helping out with thinking about how to finance the organization how to raise the next round of venture funding that's that's all really exciting yeah but but you know, it's cool to hear that one of the things you tackled coming in pretty quickly was actually helping the sales and marketing engine work more smoothly, particularly sales, right? Particularly commissions. And commissions are, as we all know, are still kind of a morass of like really difficult, uh, like hodgepodge of systems that are often used. And, you know, and there's, it's, it's, there's not a, it, it, there's not always an easy system in place that you can just kind of plug and play. So that's, that's cool. So that was one of the first things you tackled as well when you came in here. Yeah. 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 And that was, and, and it was great. And I think, um, you know, I hope everybody, it seems that everybody appreciates the added visibility I'm and sure. it saves me a lot of time too, because, mm. you know, I was the one, um, there's actually reconciling, all that. reconciling and, yeah. you know, if, if, uh, if sales reps had questions on, on something, and, you know, and they always just, do if it's not super clear. Right. Yeah. And, and so it just, uh, the idea is to give them the added visibility, work through any questions with their, with their direct manager. And then direct manager will compile a list of questions for, for us, you know, for the finance mm-hmm. and accounting department. That we can then, you know, spend an hour, sit down, reconcile, you know, anywhere where there might be an issue. And anyway, it's been a really smooth process since then, and uh, and it's it's been it's been great. Yeah, I mean, because sales reps never have 
questions about their commission or no. let alone you know conflict there's never any conflict between you know who gets paid what on deals and so uh, they're not that, coin operators right. they don't, they don't <laughs> want to maximize well, it well <laughs> i mean the reason i bring it up is that that's that's really cool that you you also implemented a process that probably got you out of quite a few of those kind of conflict resolution conversations because those can eat up a lot of a day you know i mean if uh, or at least you know I don't know if that was true or not here at Grow, but at Cash Air where we are, that that actually can eat up a lot of our time as if, you know, there's kind of reconciling the commissions, you know, dealing with the commission's potential inaccuracies. Um, certainly if there's two people that have a claim on a commission, if, the, if those are getting routed through the finance team, that those conversations are happening in the finance team, that can eat up a lot of time. So it sounds like by putting this process in place, especially, you know, I was interested when you said that the team manager can then submit questions to you. So it sounds like you also kind of helped create more definition around. Um, Put a wall between yeah, you. Yeah, like <laughs> a little bit of a wall, a little bit of, like, I don't mean that in the negative sense of that, but just a little bit more of some structure in terms of how you're yes, interfacing right. with the sales team. So um, hopefully they save up their questions for a certain time and then you just can kind of work through those all at once. Is that is that how that works? Or, exactly, yeah, yep, okay. precisely, yeah. yeah. And it's been, it's been a great, great process for yeah. us. That's awesome. So, um, and so then uh, the next bullet point that uh, that I had to tackle very quickly was uh, was Europe. So yeah, I, um, yeah, interested to hear about that. You know, That's and cool. it, it's just it's so interesting how sometimes life just comes full circle. And you know, it, it, I just so happened to be the FP&A lead um, over Europe for my last company, which was the exact experience that I that I needed to then mm -hmm. take it to the next level and you know, be the, the finance leader that went in and, and, uh, and actually helped open up a, a Europe office. And we've actually been in Europe now for um, almost one week officially. Oh, yeah, so nice. We, uh, yeah, <laughs> Where's your European office? We've been in business. We are in Reading in the UK, Okay. Um, which is just uh, 45 minutes to an hour outside of London. That's great. Huh. Um, and uh, so that was... Is that was, a much smaller office? Just out of curiosity, I mean, again, if we, you don't need to disclose numbers if that's something you keep confidential, but is it a relatively smaller office? compared to this one I mean or yeah much smaller office the intent is that it's it's strictly a sales, sales office and okay. and yeah. sales and marketing yeah Got so it. Um, minimal uh, employees there and don't foresee a ton of employees over the next uh, uh, time horizon either but mm -hmm. um, it, it's uh, you know it's we're already growing quickly um, cool. so you know the process to get that business off the ground was you know first of all build a build a model does is this mm -hmm. feasible does it work um, there were a lot of costs that I was personally unfamiliar with, and so I ended up spending a lot of time on the phone with consultants that were just like walking me through some of the legal, you know, and you know, immigration and legal and tax um, issues that we were going to run into uh, getting the business off the ground. And is and that an issue? Is value added tax like a, a thing over there? That is the whole tax structure a lot different than it is in the United States? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very different uh, different tax structure, and, and we wanted to take that into account uh, in in building this model as well. The other big piece was. Uh, um, you know, uh, foreign exchange and, and making uh, sure that we uh, hmm. um, maximized value from that perspective. Now, you know, we're not, we're certainly not in this to gamble on foreign exchange. So we wanted to have a very, um, you know, conservative uh, um, strategy in place to um, just make sure that uh, our, we covered our, our bases there. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, so, you know, built this model that took all of these things into account um, and we came to realize that it is a financially feasible, you know, the assumption was if we send sales reps out to, to Europe and they continue selling at the same pace, the same rate um, that our U.S. sales rep or our U.S. sales team is selling at uh, today, um, then we'll, um, you know, I, I used that assumption in, in the model um, and found that this actually can become a cash flow positive entity for us fairly quickly, um, which is really exciting and, you know, and it'll grow and at some point we'll have to make a decision on, you know, do we want to invest more and make it grow even faster than than what we have um, in place right now. So, um, you know, so that's so that's been a, a great thing, uh, um, or you know, a, a, a great project f um, for me to work on. Um, in Europe, um, I had one more thing I was going to say, and I'm, I'm forgetting what it was. But um, anyway, we got the model in place, built that out, um, and then we, you know, I had some great help. I, we do have an HR um, manager here at the company who um, really helped me with all of the immigration um, 
uh, issues and, and, uh, and paperwork and just helping get the business registered and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a much longer process than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, in, my recommendation is that, uh, you know, for a company that wants to know, open an office lease in the UK, uh, to plan on, you know, after you've modeled it out and decided this this makes sense, after you've selected, um, you know, a consulting group to help you open up your office in the UK, plan on four to six months from there before wow. everything's up and going. And that's your business registered, your your bank account set up, your merchant accounts, Great everything advice. up hmm. and running. So it, it just takes longer. Now for us, uh, I will say that not all um, not all issues are resolved, but you know we uh, we're out there and we're just we're kind of holding things together with um, you know with a duct tape a little bit uh, <laughs> over the next couple of months Great. until until we finalize some of those things. But mm -hmm. what uh, but I I am uh, very excited to say that we're beating our sales model already. Wow! Um, and uh, and and so so it's great. Part of the reason we decided on this is we had, and I should have said this at the beginning of my Europe piece, but um, uh, we already had quite a few customers out in the UK okay. um, that were really great customers, and and right. so and and so we decided to test it out a little bit further. We dedicated a couple of sales reps that were coming in in UK hours and selling it at. Uh, UK times two UK customers mm -hmm. and uh, we just you know we found that conversion rates and you know, lead flow and conversion rates were very very uh, similar to what we were experiencing here in in the US and and so from a marketing a market test perspective it all made sense so we applied that to our, our financial model and uh, and now we're out there and we're actually even exceeding what the, what the model predicted That's so far amazing. now we're only out there you know mm -hmm. a week uh, a week in but uh, so far so so, good. so far so good yeah could I camp here and just ask you a couple of questions again I, I do, definitely don't want to lose the overall flow but I, th I think you've good, done a good job of letting me interrupt you <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you so you know this is kind of a you know I've, I've been around I used to work as a venture capitalist for uh, for five years at Signal Peak Ventures here, kind of a fairly local firm. Mm -hmm. um, you might even know them. I don't think they're investors in Grow, but they, I'm sure they probably want to be. <laughs> but um, anyway, they're, uh, so, so, so I've been around you know, the startup industry for, for a while. And you know, rewind five, maybe even seven years ago now, the conventional wisdom was you don't need to go outside of the United States for startups. You know, it's, it's expensive, it's costly. I mean, now the conventional wisdom is, like I, when I say that, I mean a true startup. So like call it like what, by the time you're a series D or something or a series C, okay, great. You know, you're, you're doing a hundred million in sales. Of course, you're going to probably have a Europe presence. And, but, but I think that calculus has shifted a lot and you're seeing a lot more fairly early stage startups. Like you're a series A startup going to Europe. Yeah. That, that was fairly unheard of actually like five years ago, even seven, seven years ago, let's just say a decade ago was really unheard of. It was actually kind of violating conventional wisdom. It was like, look, if, if you're closing deals in the U S and you're growing really fast in the U S double down on the U S first and then go to Europe. Just interested in your kind of thinking around that. Why, why do you think that's changed? Um, you know, what, what, what do, was that question ever raised here internally? Like why not just invest more in the United States? Um, I'm curious how you came to the decision to be like, no, we're, we're going to go to Europe. It makes sense for us. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's and, a, and you can maybe answer the question from your experience with inside sales as well. Right. Cause you've kind of done it twice. So yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it's a great question. And, um, when I arrived here, um, that was my first question is, well, you know, why don't we just invest here in the U S it's cheap, it, you know, it's, it's less expensive and you know, we could, excuse me, probably experienced the, the same growth. Um, I would say that there, there were some strategic uh, considerations that I'm probably not a, at liberty to, no, to, totally to talk about. Yeah, totally fine. Um, but what I will say is that the, um, uh, the, um, the overarching principle behind the decision was um, to diversify, geographically diversify revenue sources. And we already mm -hmm. had a, a fairly strong, I, I won't say how many customers, but we had a, a strong customer base already in the in UK, Europe. Okay. and we we felt like um, you know being a little bit closer to those those customers would be good, and they were and they're good customers, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you know that was certainly a, a part of the, the decision. The other piece is you know uh, opening up an office is in the UK probably isn't as expensive today as it was seven years ago, mm. and so you know I look at it as um, in, in so in my you know the way that I look at it is. Uh, a business venture should have 
um, you know, if, if it's an economically viable venture. And I don't know that all financial finance professionals will agree with me on this, but um, an 18 month like to cash flow break even. Kind of payback period uh, type, type Payback thing. period. Yeah. And, and looking at, um, looking at the investment, we definitely, our, our model definitely fits within that time frame. Um, and, uh, and so we just thought, you know, a fairly, you know, a fair size investment, but small in comparison to other companies. Um, we send a, you know, just a few employees out there, or hire a couple of local employees, um, you know, have a small operation, but, you know, be there a little bit closer to our customers, you know, make them feel a little bit more at home with, you know, some U.S. company that, you know, is a little far away. But, you know, now we have a local office. We're serious about helping you out. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and, and why not try to grow that market as well? That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I know there's some sensitive stuff, so I really appreciate you sharing that. That is actually fascinating for me for me to learn and mm -hmm. hear. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you're right about like the cost of opening offices has probably gone down for, so I think that's true for a lot of startups too. I, I mean, I, I'm definitely not just seeing it at, at grow. So, you know, I mean, this is a bit of a trend. I'm seeing a lot of pre, even some, even some pre-Series A companies that, um, consider going into Europe. So, you know, CapShare hasn't, we're, we, we hit profitability in May, um, and there's there's some big big stuff on it coming, coming down the pipe for us, but I'm not quite at liberty to discuss yet either. But um, we have a lot of European customers as well, but we haven't opened an office there. So, um, but, but it's a really, really interesting thing. I do think internet companies are kind of by nature global from day one, almost. You know, sometimes if you're a truly, if you're a really finance intensive system and Grow is on the border of being a finance intensive system, you have to support like multiple currencies pretty quickly out of the shoots. But other than that, you know, a lot of internet applications, SaaS businesses are kind of inherently global from the minute they launch. And so you, that's another piece I think that's more and more true, um, you know, um, I don't know whether it's just that the internet continues to globalize everything. Um, but, you know, rewind a decade ago and, you know, it might be a really long time before someone in the UK even knew about a system like Grow or had, had, or certainly had ever been exposed to your brand. Whereas now, you know, it's a, you're, it's a few clicks away, a Google search away, right, that they're kind of getting exposed to you. So you probably had a lot of clients in Europe and, and you kind of did already say that you did have quite a few clients in Europe before you even opened the office there, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you for that digression. So anyway, so kind of back on kind of the things that you did when you first started. So one of the first things was the European office. So, yeah. Yep, and, uh, and and European office. So we, we've talked about finance, we've talked about accounting, we've now talked about um, the expansion into Europe. Um, I would say, um, you know, another another big uh, piece of my, uh, my role here, and, and we've talked about payroll as well. Um, and then the, the final piece is investor relations and also uh, yep. cap table management. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I will say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will say Capture has been awesome. Thank like, you. For, yes. for a finance uh, professional who came to this company and had never seen this company's cap table before, I had never used CapShare before. Awesome. It was just a completely seamless transition. And I am so just happy at how, um, you know, uh, how easy it has been to use. Now, there's a lot of like, uh, um, areas that are outside of my wheelhouse from a legal perspective, and so I, I get a lot of support there. Yeah. Um, but as far as just strictly managing the cap table, it's it's been it, it, you know your software's been awesome. awesome. So I, I recommend it. And does that thank fall? You. Just out of curiosity, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Like, we we're so grateful for that. But uh, does that would that be your area of responsibility? Like managing cap table is that that's you, right? You you basically own that function. Uh, for in the short run, yes. So yes. Now at a larger company, um, I would say that it's much more of a legal uh, okay. function than than finance. But so it would actually maybe um, go to like the general counsel's office at some point. Right. Yes. It, it, at the point where you know uh, ready to hire a general counsel and bring on paralegals and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Until then, it makes sense to that, uh, that finance. finance owns it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, so that's been a, a big piece, and, and and that's the one area where you know I have just left things as they were is uh, is, is the cap table um, management piece. It's it's worked out well for us, cool. um, and then uh, you know and then investor relations. Yeah. Um, so. No major changes, uh, you know, to process there at all. It's you know, um, that's generally um, you know I get fairly ad hoc requests from investors, um, you know, uh, with questions on how things are going. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and, you know, then participation and preparation in, in board meetings um, as well. And, and that's been, um, 
uh, it's been great. I, we have a, we have a great board of directors here at Grow, and, and we receive awesome guidance from them. They're super supportive of what we're doing. Um, excited about the success that we've had. Um, you know, and, and we're certainly not without our struggles, um, and we have some struggles we're working through right now. And our our board is is just super helpful and, and understanding there. So. Um, so that, those are kind of the different areas that uh, yeah, you know that I've great. tackled since yeah. uh, since day one, and um, it's been it, it's been the funnest like uh, period of my career that I've that I can say I've had so far. That's so great. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, so, like, that was. I, I, can I, cool. Before we totally leave it, I, I want to ask you one more thing on investor relations, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, on investor relations, do you do like um, do you do like a monthly update? Uh, is there like a regular update to your investor group? How frequently does it go out? Who's in charge of running, of like writing that content? Does it come from Rob? Rob's the CEO of Grow. Does it come from you? A combination of both. Just curious how that gets kind of tackled in terms of like, you know, you, you said, you mentioned ad hoc requests and maybe it is, maybe you just re reply to ad hoc requests as they come in. But do you have anything more structured than that around like kind of regular update? The only structured reporting that we do um, specifically to uh, equity investors is our board meeting, mm -hmm. um, and then and then ad hoc requests. Okay, yeah. and, and that that's very common too, right? So and the board meeting preparation is is generally spearheaded by our. Now I've seen you know board prep um, go different ways in my experience. Um, sometimes it's the FP and A team that just leads totally. it out and completely quarterbacks the entire board deck. Um, here, uh, our CEO, Rob, uh, he takes takes charge, and then um, uh, and, and then we have a VP of operations here, and he and I work together to, okay. to help um, with some of the deck, and then we also have, a lot of times it's just, you know, it's gonna be the de department uh, or, or group owners that uh, are asked to contribute content. They'll put together content, and then ultimately, our CEO consolidates and, and summarizes, and then and then sends out the deck a day or two um, before we need to send it out to the board, and then the entire leadership team goes through the deck, makes sure it looks all right, uh, and then we send it off to the board a couple of days in advance of the board meeting. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, actually, I had one more. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah kind of please. Follow up. Yeah. Um, and this is maybe going to be a bit of a recap of what you just said, but. Uh, and say like if if if, uh, if you have a new um, kind of finance leader who's just taking the reins of a you know maybe a hundred employee company, and you know they're they're just kicking things off like you did, is there a like would there be like a checklist that you might say like hey I would probably start with here maybe talk to this person make sure this is in place and um, I don't know maybe that you could kind of. Uh, some advice that you could share, I guess. Directly within the company is what you're asking. Like, yeah. who, who, who am I? Who do I need to talk to? And yeah, yeah. Well, I think every company is going to be structured differently. Mm -hmm. um, and as a finance guy, I want to know who's who's the who's the next guy that knows the data systems and sources better than anybody else, and that person will immediately become your best friend. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. For a for a long for time. For you, was that one of the existing finance team members? Just out of curiosity. I, I guess I don't, yeah, maybe that's too personal, but where do you think that person, what, what function is that person usually in? And is it different in every company? Is it, is, could it be like a VP of operations in some companies? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, so, um, you know, from, from my career experience, so, excuse me, I was at uh, Intel for a long time and yes. and I just say leave them out of the equation because that's a, that's a very different world altogether. Yeah. But um, between inside sales and, uh, and grow, um, I've generally found that that, uh, that expertise resides with, with uh, folks in operations. Operations, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. sense. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and I was very lucky to come on here at Grow. We have a phenomenal VP of operations who just, he knows our, he's, first of all, he's like architected our systems in a way that everything is like, there's so much automation, everything's mm -hmm. talking to each other, a lot of integrity behind the data. Um, and uh, and so that that's been very helpful and allowed me to really build out some robust models and, and things that um, uh, have been have been good. Um, and he's also you know just super helpful in, in helping me get acc acclimated here um, and comfortable with all the data that uh, that I'm looking at. So mm -hmm. yeah, I imagine the first month or so for most would be just trying to consolidate the accuracy of the data and figuring out why there's discrepancies and things and for you I guess you were able to say like wow I can build stuff with this right away and 
kind of get to work there. But yeah, yeah, it was it was very helpful. So you know, not to say that there aren't discrepancies and you know things mm-hmm. of that nature that every business is going to have, but mm-hmm. in my experience, this this you know grow has had the cleanest data I've ever seen. Yeah, in, nice. in my career so far. Very cool. Well, hey, we really appreciate your time, um, and you know, I think, and we hope a lot of other folks will too. Um, this is this is a pretty amazing podcast because I mean. I, I think, or video cast, or whatever we want to call it, but um, you know, I, I think you basically have heard from a, a really strong Series A company how you know how you've chosen to focus your time to create maximum results within kind of the first call it. You know, they often talk about the first 180 days or first 30 days, 180 days in a new job or in, a, in even in like a lot of times you'll hear them talk about like the president of the United States what they accomplished in the first six months. We kind of just got like, hey, this is a roadmap for what you can do when you first get into a new finance, uh, head of finance position. So mm-hmm. really appreciate it. I think it's going to be hugely valuable and obviously appreciate the capture plug. So uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure we feature that like, you know, right front and center. <laughs> uh, That's the anyway. teaser for the video. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said capture. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much.